All right, why don't we go ahead and get started. So I want to welcome everybody to this month's version of what's the point where we're going to ask the question and answer the question, what is the point of facility management? Uh, joining me today is a great friend and business partner of, of Touchpoint named Lee Cool. Lee is the Director of Sales and Marketing, and just as his name implies, very cool guy. I love hanging out with him. I don't mean that in a cheesy way. He really is a cool guy, uh, very down to earth and very knowledgeable when it comes to facilities management. So Ali, if you want to say hello. Awesome. Hey guys, thank you so much for having me, Michael. Absolutely. Um, so, so I will be kicking off the first portion of today's webinar and then Lee will be uh, kind of taking over. And as usual, um, if you have any questions that you'd like answered today, please just select the Q&A icon and you can uh, submit your question there. We'll try to answer all of them live. And for those that we aren't able to get to live, we will uh, follow up with an email. So here is today's agenda. Um, and as you can see, we're gonna obviously start off with, you know, the, the high level question of what is the point of facility management? And then we'll kind of segue into building facility stewardship, which which is a term that you may not have really thought about, but I think after we kind of walk through um, some of the things to consider with facilities management, you'll see why we call it stewardship. And then we'll talk about a, a maintenance management strategy uh, and then the integration that we have with between Touchpoint and eSpace. We'll move on from there. All right, so what is the point of facilities management? Well. Look, the reality is when you look at your church, everything in your church has a lifestyle. I mean, not, not a lifestyle, a life cycle, life cycle. I've had three cups of coffee today, so I really don't even have an excuse. A life cycle. Um, the Probably the biggest um, offenders, if you will, as it relates to things that are going to ultimately deteriorate in your, in your church would be your floors and your HVAC. But your roof is also going to deteriorate. Your parking lots are going to deteriorate. Even the paint on your walls will eventually deteriorate. So what is important to a church is to plan for these things. Plan for them knowing that inevitably you're going to have to spend money on it. And it's like Dave Ramsey says, you know, you know one day you're going to have to, need, you're going to, have to buy a sofa. Why wait until that day to pony up the money? Go ahead and set aside little amounts each month so that when that day comes, you have that money. Well, that's essentially what we're talking about here. So when you when you consider, and I just realized I have not advanced my slide. There we go. So when you consider the things that are going to deteriorate at your church, um, the assets as it relates to your building, understand that typically things deteriorate at about a one to four percent rate. Um, and, and depending on where you live, you might see that uh, your rate is a little bit more aggressive or less aggressive. For example, if you live in Florida, uh, where you have you know, high humidity, high salt uh, in the air content, you're probably going to see that your HVAC system is failing much faster than someone who lives, say, in Arizona, right? So uh, Arizona is probably not a good example. Let's say Tennessee. Um, so the point is, depending on your geography is going to indicate just how quickly things are going to deteriorate. But the bottom line is you want to be able to plan for that. So what does that look like? Well, um, first, it, it looks like creating a budget. Again, you know, if we're talking about a one to four percent deterioration rate, look at the things that you know you're going to have to replace one day, and start setting aside that one to four percent per year into some sort of an account. So when that day comes, you're ready with the with those funds. You're not having to come up with it because the reality is. It's fun to spend money on new enhancements that make our church facility much better. So uh, if we're buying a gymnasium or if we're in, improving and, and expanding our atrium, that's exciting. But when the HVAC fails, not very exciting. That, that hurts. That's hard to pay for, right? Um, but the reality is it's coming. So go ahead and budget for that. Another thing you can do to really help plan for it is to do appropriate maintenance, which is going to extend the life of the assets you have at your church. Change your HVAC filters on a regular basis. Um, seal your parking lot. Uh, that's, again, something that's going to extend the life. Just common cleaning of a lot of your facilities can extend the life of those assets. It's also helpful when you have capable staff. And by capable staff, I'm not talking about, you know, Mark the maintenance guy who knows how to fix a problem when that problem comes up. 
work is important, but you need someone who also can be very proactive, someone who understands that things are going to happen if we don't take care of the maintenance um, and if we're if we're not finding ways to extend the life of those assets. You know, being able to have someone who's proactively tracking what our assets are, the deterioration rate of those assets, and that person is scheduling regular maintenance and keeping a log of that maintenance. So you have a historical um, a view of what kind of maintenance has taken place on those assets. And then finally, it's important to be sure that that individual isn't the only individual that has that information. Have some kind of a system where you're able to store that so anybody can access it, whether that's a filing system uh, or a um, you know, post-it notes on a whiteboard, or if it's a, a software program, have something so that when that individual retires, the, the tracking and scheduling and historical data of your assets is easily accessible by everybody uh, that needs to know. So I love this quote from John Wooden. He's the, the famous basketball coach. He said, if you don't have time to do it right, then when will you have time to do it over? Great question. Because how many times do we cut corners saying, you know what, I'll do it later. I don't have time now. We never have time. Do it right the first time, right? If you think about, if you think about um, uh, Franklin, not Franklin, but, but uh, Covey's, Stephen Covey's um, uh, four quadrants of need. You have, you know, the needs that get addressed the, the fastest are those urgent, important needs. But then we have urgent, important, uh, urgent needs that aren't necessarily very important. So we can kick the can down the road a little bit. But then we have those important needs that aren't very urgent that we tend to ignore. And those are the ones that can bite us. Those are the ones that we know are going to hurt down the line, but we tend to turn a blind eye to them because, well, it's not urgent right this moment. It's important that we don't ignore that. It's important that we're planning ahead for those things. So I want to do a quick survey here because uh, I'd be curious what the uh, what the if 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 what we see from the crowd that's in today's uh, what's the point would align with a survey that we did about churches that are doing a capital sorry about that a capital reserve account a capital reserve account being an account that you're setting aside funds for these kinds of of events so if I can I'm going to try my best to uh, go ahead and set up a poll. And this shouldn't take you more than about 15 seconds. Here we go. I'm going to go ahead and launch it. Take about 10, 15 seconds and please respond to this poll. We'll see how it turns out. Take about five more seconds. Okay. Fascinating. So when we look at the results of the poll that was already conducted, obviously you see here 21% of churches did not have a capital uh, reserve account set up. What I'm seeing here among this crowd is almost a similar, uh, is a very similar number. 17% do not have it set up, 68% do, and then 15% weren't sure. So obviously that 15% is going to uh, kind of balance out between the group, but curious, um, Lee, what are, what are your thoughts? As you hear the fact that the, you know, the, especially the no is almost perfectly aligned with your poll. What are your thoughts here? Yeah, I, I think this is totally in line and, you know, this is just something we see so often in church facilities. And I see you just posted those numbers. I'm not surprised. And I think, you know, when you think about what is the cause of this, you know, Michael, you gave a great explanation as to why we need capital reserves, why it's important. And I think a big thing is churches don't necessarily think about it. And I love your analogy of the quadrants kind of from Stephen Covey, where you have important and urgent, and we're trying to find the things that may not be very urgent, but they're hugely important, you know, and catching those before they become urgent. Uh, a lot of churches are just so understaffed and kind of playing this game of catch up. It's, you know, how, how could we ever plan for this? So um, I'm not surprised by, by what we see at all here, Michael. Um, and, and to kind of go a step further with this, you know, part of what we're going to talk about today is facility stewardship. I know we kind of start off the call addressing maintenance and, and really the reason I like, I'm glad that Michael, you started off the call addressing life cycles, capital reserves and things like that is because that's something we all forget about. And that's usually a result of us being understaffed, right? So 
when we come to think, okay, facility. By the way, I apologize. I'm going to go apologize. I was trying to move the uh, the slides over on the screen, and I lost them completely. So <laughs> <laughs> keep going. I'll get to your visuals back in a moment. I apologize uh, for that. <laughs> no, that's okay. Uh, but when we think facility stewardship, you know, what do we even think we do in our facilities, right? So we have the maintenance, which we outlined. We have expensive equipment to take care of. We host events. We do all these different things in facilities. Usually the last thing we think about is what is the money I need to save to replace that HVAC unit? The paint on my walls, the carpet, the roofs, the parking lots, all of those components. And, and primarily, what can we do proactively now to extend the life of those kinds of things? So a facilities team advocate, have we met the basic needs of the facilities team? Do leaders understand the conditions and operations of the facilities team. So let's think about how a facilities team operates. And if you're a part of facilities, you're probably having a bunch of things go to head. How do we really operate? Um, and we have a couple different types of maintenance, which we will talk about. Uh, I mentioned a little bit about preventative and we have reactive maintenance, things like that. Uh, but really, I think a key component to consider with this, especially going back to the need and kind of the issue that leads to this deferred maintenance that requires capital uh, expenditures is this understaffed. So how can we as an understaffed church work smarter rather than harder, right? So understanding the conditions and operations of facilities team to accomplish that, not just being reactive, but finding a way to be proactive and work smarter. So how do we do that? And more importantly, do we have a realistic budget in place for when those things happen? You know, even if we're as proactive as we can be, there's still going to come a time where we reach the end of the life cycle of that HVAC unit. And, you know, as Michael outlined in Florida, my HVAC unit may only last 12 years because I'm near the coast. I have salt water, the conditions, everything else like that, where in Tennessee or in North Carolina, it's going to last closer to 20. So it's like, are we planning for that? Are we aware of it? And are we truly setting aside dollars for those replacements year over year? <laughs> So if you can hit the next slide. Um, so there's really uh, four key maintenance management strategies or really four types of maintenance. The first one is the one we all know of, and this is the most popular. And frankly, there's no escaping it. This is your break fix kind of scenario. Spill on aisle 12. We need to change a light bulb. We need to do X, Y, Z. This is where anybody in the facility can spot it. And we just know that we need to get it done. There's no running away from this. And I think it's very important, especially for this kind of stuff, to have history of seeing what's happened. You know, even for corrective stuff, I think data could be extremely important where we're identifying like, okay, and I use this analogy relatively often, but I had a leak in the sanctuary and the east wall the past three times the past year. What is that telling you? You know, maybe it's not that you've actually fixed the leak. Maybe there's an underlying issue. There's a damaged shingle above it. There's roofs or there's gutters overflowing. You know, maybe there's something deeper that we haven't identified that's causing us to have this issue over and over again. So I think there could even be a science done in some reactive maintenance in certain areas or in more of a corrective maintenance manner. The second type of maintenance, and this is one I, I wish we can kind of do a, a study or pull on this too, but like how many churches really do preventative maintenance? And I talk to churches and I ask them if they do preventative maintenance. And they, they say, oh, our contractors do that for us. And um, I think they're just taking a very small grasp of the things you could do for preventative maintenance. And, you know, let's define preventative maintenance real quick. So maintenance is kind of back to that quadrant. It's very important to be doing. It's not urgent, but it's something that is going to extend the life of components within our facility. Therefore, knowing that those items will cost money down the road, you're actually expanding your capital for the church in a, in a sense. But uh, it's the maintenance that's regularly performed on a piece of equipment or really any component of your facility to lessen the likelihood of it failing. So there's a lot of examples of it. The easiest one is change your filters on your HVAC unit. You know, that's, that's a simple one. There's also things like that more, maybe more related to security and safety than it is the maintenance of the facility, checking our emergency lights, inspecting fire extinguishers. Maybe you are gonna go in, inspect the gutters to make sure they're not overflowing uh, on a recurring basis. There's lots of different things like that that can be done and they can save you a lot of trouble down the road. So it's like truly taking concept of what are those things we need to do and having an action plan and accountability to do them on a frequent and recurring basis. So, uh, and also this is, it's preventative because this is stuff we do while the things are still working before problems even come to play. 
predictive maintenance. This is a really new one that us as a company are actually looking to develop more into. But the idea of predictive maintenance is before that drip pan is overflowing or before a leak even happens, there's some tool, some sensor to let you know it's about to happen or that something's about to go wrong. Or if there's a certain vibration that you know you shouldn't be hearing in your HVAC unit, whatever that is, there are actually devices out there. And this is kind of next level technology that is being developed in our day and age right now. Um, and I could probably ramble about this for a while, but I typically see churches are 15 to 20 years behind in technology compared to any other real industry. Um, and most churches aren't even aware of this kind of stuff, but th this is out here right now. And there's companies that are continuing to develop and further the use of this. Um, you know, like we're actually about to start utilizing sensors to notify people when this kind of stuff is about to happen. So there's some really cool stuff in here. And if you have like a building automation system um, or certain HVAC controllers, some of those even have predictive maintenance tied in. Uh, you know, if you need a compressor replaced, if you need to add Freon, anything like that, it'll actually tell you in those kind of systems too, which is really cool. Uh, but that's predictive maintenance. That's really a piece of the future. And then last but not least, you have the silent church killer, deferred maintenance. And I, I think a lot of people know what deferred maintenance is, but this is the practice of postponing hence deferred, maintenance activities such as repairs on real property in order to save costs, meet budget funding, and realign your available budget. Run, forest run. You do not want to get deferred maintenance. It is the silent church killer for a reason. A lot of the times deferred maintenance, it's you don't even see it, or you see it when it's too late. You know, going back to Michael's example earlier, what happens when that HVAC starts working or stops working on a Sunday morning, right? That's not the most attractive thing in the world to want to address and fix. That happened because potentially we weren't taking care of it or we waited too long to replace it, right? So that is a good example, deferred maintenance. And we're about to see some, uh, a, little, a little scary example of some deferred maintenance here. So these are actually real pictures uh, other than the one in the top right that we have uh, took as we are going in churches facilities. We also help with uh, assessing facilities and finding this kind of stuff. But uh, my favorite is the box over the toilet. Um, you, you can't make this stuff up. But this is what it looks like to have deferred maintenance. And you may be like looking at some of these pictures like this doesn't look so bad. Obviously, the toilet looks terrible. You see the air vents. That's awful. You know, you see the little leaf coming out of the concrete. You may be like, Lee come on, you're being too stubborn now. That's not so bad. We have that everywhere. It's like, okay, well, what do you think's happening underneath? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll leave that alone. But and yeah, even I got to say something real quick. I, I, <laughs> I was at a sports facility that was made for kids to play basketball in, and they actually had on a toilet like this, the metal missing and wires sticking out, the one that was designated for kids. Like kids aren't going to be curious and grab the wire. And uh, and anyway, yeah, I couldn't believe it. I, that just reminded me. It's really mm, <laughs> deferred maintenance is a horror. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And even just the downspouts, like the water is just literally sitting there and getting underneath the concrete. I mean, come on, man. Anyway, <laughs> so, <laughs> so I, I first want to share, too, before we kind of transition into Touchpoint in eSpace, um, we need to talk about how did we go from maintenance to this, right? And I, I think we're going to continue to go back to this idea of why is it an issue? It's typically because we're understaffed, or in some cases, we just lack the knowledge. So I highly recommend just educating yourself on the appropriate things to do. Um, but how can we truthfully work smarter, not harder? It's much easier said on paper to say, let's just go hire more people. Um, and kind of to give you an indicator if you're understaffed or not, we typically advise for every 35,000 square feet that you have, you have one person for general maintenance. That is not your facility manager. That is not custodial, right? That is just general maintenance. So you can kind of do your own math if you know your square footage and you can figure out how understaffed you are. But that to be able to do all preventative maintenance, reactive maintenance, all of those things, that's a huge huge, huge, huge requirement that we've seen from our studies. But going back to this idea of working smarter, not harder, is how can we have systems related to facilities talking to each other? Um, so in eSpace, as you all may know, we handle event scheduling. And part of our kind of way of working smarter, not harder is integrating those systems with HVAC, with doors, 
And the way it works is if I have an event scheduled in the system, it'll automatically trigger my HVAC. It'll automatically lock and unlock my door. So we don't have to manage that. Therefore I'm working smarter, not harder, but typically you also have to plug that event information into your membership system, like church team, or I'm sorry, it's like touch point. I apologize, but in touch, You're point, fired. I know, <laughs> I'm done, but in touch point, we have the ability to see all of the important things with people. I'm very myopic where I just look at facilities for the most part, because that's my bread and butter. But there's so much more to know than just the details of the event. You know, how many times did Johnny go to this event and all of the things that we don't do? So how can we have tools that talk to each other? So, Michael, I'll kind of let you share. And I apologize if I stepped on toes a little, but uh, you're, you're fine. Yeah. Yeah. So what you're seeing here, this is this is the um, just an animation, if you will, of a touch point event. So when you set up the event and go into the settings, you have the ability to um, to go down to advanced setups and determine what facility is going to be integrated with eSpace. And then, um, Lee, I'm going to let you kind of talk about what those specific integrations are going to talk about. But um, some of the things I've heard in the past have to do with, you know, load balancing, and then of course, HVAC timing, uh, based on that load balancing and such. But why don't you go ahead and talk a little bit more about that. So I'm not accidentally misstating. Yeah, so we do facilities. And that's all we do. I mean, we handle tracking maintenance, we handle tracking events and all of those good things. But we do not deal with people right? That is not our specialty. So we rely on partners like Touchpoint because they do such a good job at those kind of components and the tracking and everything else that's related to it. You know, we do not want to be this McDonald's where we do everything and we do it all very poorly. You know, we want to be the Chick-fil-A where we also work with other Chick-fil-A's that are the best at what they do so that you could be most efficient in your ministry and just realizing that facilities is a part of that. Uh, if that kind of makes sense. And I don't know if that's what you were teeing me up for, Michael, yeah. but. Perfect. It was perfect. So let me get to the, uh, I think I accidentally jumped ahead. Sorry about that. There we go. So this is just another look that you might want to talk through about uh, uh, some of that integration in action. Right. So this is, pr this is primarily creating an event in eSpace. And to kind of talk deeper about the specifics of what this integration looks like, we create the event in eSpace. And the reason we start in eSpace space is because we first want to make sure a room is available before people register for it, right? So we want to make sure the room's available and we need to nail down all the setup details. So kind of what this, this little video is showing, it's all the details related to the event. So setup and teardown times, when does it start? How often is it happening? How many people are coming? But also more details that could be added is, you know, what tables and chairs do we need? Where do those tables and chairs go? How do they need to look like? Which rooms do each one go in? Are there any other support services we need like AV, like security and components tied to that? So we take care of that stuff here in eSpace and then we bring it over to Touchpoint so they can add it to theirs. <laughs> yeah. So, so again, what you what you essentially have is you just have a door. You have an open door. So, when you're in the event in Touchpoint and you want to dive into the specifics about the facility and schedule things like what Lee was talking about with the uh, with the HVAC timing and and with the um, the the tables and chairs that you're going to need in those rooms, you can simply, as you saw a moment ago on this video, you can go down to the event and just click on the link, and it's going to take you straight into eSpace. So. It's almost like it's just another button inside of Touchpoint. And frankly, I just got to say too, after, uh, I work with a lot of clients that use Touchpoint. I don't know if we would be able to be successful at what we do without companies like Touchpoint that do such a good job of what they do on their end. You know, and from a facilities point of view, yes, we need to book the events, but it needs to go much deeper than that. There's so much in touch with people that needs to be taken care of. Um, which this is where it's gets, getting out of my wheelhouse where we actually talk about those things, hence why we're not the experts on it. But we, we would not be able to do this as successfully without being able to track those things that Touchpoint does. You're just saying that because you threw out a competitor's name, but thank you for <laughs> it. We'll take it. <laughs> All right. So let's go ahead and we'll open it up for uh, any Q&A coming from the audience. Um, so if you have a question, again, just um, go down to the bottom where it says chat and uh, and you can address that question. I saw uh, a few come in earlier. So Haley or Katie, do we have any uh, any questions that need to be addressed? 
And if, if I can add something too, is we're looking for yeah, questions. I, I think leveraging software and technology at your church is not only a very wise decision for seeing historical data and for getting reports and all the information that you need, but it's also the cheapest employee that you're ever gonna hire. So it's a very wise decision to consider that, especially in a world or a quote unquote industry where technology is really not leveraged much. You know, How can we stand out? How can we be better than what we were doing 20 years ago? How can we make decisions today that are gonna impact us positively for the next 20 years? Rather than doing it the way we always used to do it, how can we create the new way to do it moving forward? I just think it's very important to uh, take account for. Thanks for that. So Lee, the first question is, um, how do you know what percentage of your budget you want to allocate toward a capital reserve account? Yeah, really the best way to do it. Um, I know people that'll throw out, you know, 10%, 25%, and they'll kind of have those numbers. I think that's fine. It always depends your budget, of course, and your facility, because your budget doesn't dictate the money that you'll need for capital reserves. I mean, that's that's the end of the end of the thing for me is I don't see it as a percentage, but I say I need to take track of the remaining useful life of all of those items. Uh, we have something too called a life cycle calculator. It's just a free piece of software we offer, um, but that you can actually plug in the remaining useful life of your assets, HVAC units, roofs, parking lots, paint your paintings, I mean, everything will have a life cycle. So how do we track that? And that calculator will tell you, this is how much you need to set aside each year to plan to replace this X years from now. So I don't see it as much as a percentage, but I do see it as a calculation to get to, right? So hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, appreciate that. Um, all right, so another question that comes in, um, oh, they just moved on me, is, and I'm gonna kind of read it because it's long, but, um, do you have kind of a consolidated collection of those suggested staffing ratios that you touched on earlier when you'd mentioned, you know, one maintenance person per 35,000 square feet? Can you maybe use some examples of church sizes and what you're seeing there? Yeah, totally. So, I mean, kind of just using that same equation, let's say we have 75,000 square feet. It's pretty decent numbers, the decent sized church. So that means I have two general maintenance people. I have one facility manager. And I also have custodian. So having all those people for that kind of size building would be appropriate. Perfect. Um, this, is a, this is a good question. Um, and it, it may be just something you've heard in, in passing, or maybe you all deal with this regularly, but do you know of any grants or funds that are available to assist with uh, asbestos abatement? That's not an easy word to say after long. Asbestos. Hmm. I don't in asbestos, but whoever asked that question, uh, where are you located? I'm, I'm curious, because I may know of some other grants in your area. It may not be related to asbestos, but it may be able to be used for asbestos. So I'll wait for that response. In the meantime, one of the questions was, you know, how much of the involvement is done in eSpace versus Touchpoint? Um, I think the way that, that um, uh, Lee said it earlier was best. If it has to do with people, it's going to be in touch point. If it has to do with the facilities or the things inside the facilities, that it's going to be handled inside of, of eSpace. Would you say it any differently, Lee? I think it would depend how you use eSpace too, um, because I think if it has to deal with people, it's got to go to touch point regardless. How it gets there is up to you. If you need to book that event and have tables, chairs, resources, and you need facility components tied to it, it may be best to start in eSpace, but as long as it gets to touch point, that's the goal. So luckily you kind of have both options there. A lot of the clients that I speak with use eSpace as the master calendar. So just to consider that consistency, you may want to have it in eSpace as well. But as long as it gets to touch point one way or the other, I think you're fine. But and then the, the person who asked about asbestos earlier is uh, located in Northwest Indiana, about 40 miles outside of Chicago. Oh, you're in Indiana. Um, there is, who was it? The Center for Congregations, I think, in Indiana. They do have grants available for certain facility needs. Center for Congregations, look that up. If you Google Center for Congregation grants in Indiana, you will find some different options there. I think they had one I don't know if it's still relevant today, but they had one about a year or two ago where it was for facilities improvements. I think it, that's what it was. And for that, you could probably use that for asbestos. So that's probably a really good bet for you there. 
you got to thank you. That's a good answer right there. (laughs) (laughs) Um, All right. So I think I heard you answer this question, but maybe they're asking it in a different way because I've been kind of reading some questions while I'm listening to you. Going back to the ratio of staff, do you include custodial staff in your one to 35,000 calculation? No. (laughs) No. Okay. No, just general maintenance. General reactive maintenance and preventative maintenance. Yep. That's it. Um, a question that's a, that that's a big up, shocker to a lot of people, by the way. But yeah. that's think about it. <laughs> um, so one question came up about the pricing for the the two combined. Um, actually, you would we would provide pricing um, individually. The integration is already built in in place, so it's really just a question of are you going to be using both platforms? Uh, let's see here. Is the eSpace calendar on the app? that the facilities team members can access quickly quickly on their phones for daily setups and events. We are a mobile app. So we're a progressive web app. You can access it on any device very easily. Your mobile phone, we have the app for that. iPads, Macs, all that good stuff. Okay. And as a general rule that you can obviously, you know, go into detail later, do you have integrations outside of TouchPoint with other church management platforms? We do, but none of them are as good, frankly. And frankly, you guys spent a lot of time building this one and none of the other people want to work with us. And to be able to have it in the flow that we have with TouchPoint, very few other church management softwares are building that stuff. We do have a few others, but they're, I don't, you know, there's definitely some holes that are dropped there. I'm really sorry to hear that. Um, so <laughs> no, no sarcasm there. Uh, let's see here. I think the rest of them are answered for the cost for so again uh, another question just about pricing we would love to visit with you but pricing is going to really depend on on each church um it's going to depend on you know a lot of different factors so um happy to set up some time and walk through that we're not wanting to hide the pricing it's just uh it, it really will vary uh from from church to church so let me know uh set up my, my email address, by the way, is michael.faulkner at touchpointsoftware.com. And Lee, do you want to give yours? Sure. Mine is Lee, L-E-E, if, you, if that was hard enough to spell, uh, at smartchurchsolutions.com. Awesome. And I was going to add that to a chat, but I'm not seeing a chat here. So I think we are through the questions. That was a lot of good questions. I appreciate that. And if we didn't get to yours, if we somehow missed it, again, please send me an email, michael.faulkner at touchpointsoftware.com. And I'd be happy to, uh, to answer that. And obviously you've got Lee's as well. Uh, we'll be happy to, to uh, do anything we can to answer your questions, whether it's pricing or integration specific or just uh, uh, product specific. Or you know, if you just have general questions about facilities management, I mean, as you heard from Lee today, he's not trying to push product. He really loves what he does and understands the reasoning behind uh, facilities management and is a great, great resource. So Lee, if you don't have anything else to add, which obviously feel free to let me know if you do, but I'll go ahead and give everyone about five minutes back today. Yeah, I was just going to say thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure to connect with you on a webinar, and uh, we're just thrilled with the integration of Touchpoint, frankly. And we love everything that you guys are doing and we hear great stuff from our clients. So just a huge thank you for that. Wonderful. I appreciate you saying that. Thanks for joining us. And thank you everybody for joining us for this month's edition of What's the Point? We'll look forward to seeing you next month. Take care.